Okay. There we go. We're live. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> this is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anise. I'm Remy. I'm Gerald. And I'm Maya. And before we get started, I should let everybody know that sometimes we do have potty mouth, and if that happens, check the website, check your iTunes. We do go ahead and rate each individual story. And again, before we begin, we have an announcement. So Literary Roadhouse mm -hmm. will be launching a second podcast, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club in January. The book club is once a month podcast where we'll discuss a full length novel. Uh, I'll be hosting for sure, and my wonderful co-hosts are going to opt in as takes their fancy. And our first novel to be discussed on January 1st, 2016, is Margaret Atwood's new book, The Heart Goes Last. So pick up a copy today and start reading with us. Once again, that's The Heart Goes Last by Margaret Atwood. And now on with the show. So if you haven't read The Semplica Girl Diaries by George Saunders, big mistake, you totally should. <laughs> uh, come back or listen to the summary. So the story is written as a series of journal entries that capture the anxiety and optimism of a lower middle class father struggling to provide for his family. He wants to not only feed and clothe them but swath them in the signifiers of status and class that will allow his children to go forth with dignity and confidence. The trouble is his credit cards are maxed out and his income is insufficient to even cover monthly bills. His eldest daughter, Lily, is celebrating her birthday soon, just weeks after a very wealthy family celebrated theirs in a lavish garden party. The narrator's scraggy yard doesn't inspire much birthday cheer. Then the narrator wins $10,000 lottery, just enough to landscape the yard for a surprise party and buy Semplica Girls, which are a culturally ubiquitous lawn ornament. Semplica Girls are young women brought to America from impoverished nations. In the story, Somalia, the Philippines, Moldova, and Laos are named. They are hung above lawns, like dolls, with microline, a uh, bio-silk thre thread, running through their temples. The girls are paid volunteers who work for a couple years at a time and usually send their wages home to help their impo impoverished families abroad. Eva, the middle child, is very sensitive and upset by the girls hanging in their yard. One evening, she helps the girls run away. The family discovers the next day that they are on the hook for thousands of dollars to the corporation that traffics in the Semplica girls. The father tries to reconcile his daughter's moral code with the culture they live in and compares the benefits provided to the Semplica girls versus the cons of their employment. He worries about his daughter's ability to navigate the reality of their future. <laughs> This story, man, this story, excellent summary. Oh, my goodness. Where do we even begin with this story? Um, top level, did we like it? Did we hate it? I liked it. How about you, Rami? So, so. Let me guess. Rami didn't like it. So, so. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. I called it. Yeah, well, whatever. Remy's wrong because it's brilliant and the best story ever. <laughs> okay, I love this story. And I have to tell you guys, if you, oh my goodness, read it on paper and then go and get the audiobook of his collection of short stories. He reads them. It's kind of weird because he sounds hella younger than you would expect George Sanders to sound. Like, I kept looking to see if he was really the narrator. But there's a rhythm in the story that comes out in audio that is really easy to overlook on paper. And it is brilliant as audio. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what did we guys, what did we like about it? Especially you, Remy, because I can tell you're holding back some criticism that you're just going to unleash on us later and no. tell us why we're all wrong. <laughs> no, no, really. Um, I, I don't have much to say about it. Um, I know, like, what I didn't like, but as far as what I liked, it is very creative. Um, it, it's got a great message, and it's done in a creative way. Can we talk a little bit about the voice? Um, it was a very stilted, very much like reading from a journal, but not like a normal journal. Like when I write in a journal, I write in a very narrative way. This was written like a man who's used to like writing notes for work who's suddenly deciding to write a diary entry, which I think was really hard to achieve, but done really effectively. It's done in shorthand. At some points, it's almost stilted English, but you get the sense that it's literally he's writing in his journal in like shorthand quick writing at the end of the day to get it 
on paper. And I felt like that really came across. And I really admired the author because I feel like that was a huge risk. Like he could have lost the reader with that. And in some places it did kind of, you know, when you're reading a story and you come out of it a little bit because of the language, like it took me out of the story just a little bit, but it was done so creatively that I didn't mind. And in that respect, I would almost put the style of writing as, as almost experimental just because it wasn't written in a way that we normally read short stories. Yeah, I, it, I, I, I didn't have any problem with the reading of it. I, I, you know, a couple of sentences in, you think, oh, this is interesting, this is different. So you, um, but it, I just sort of slunk into the narrative um, and just went along with the story. First read through was was great. Really enjoyed it as as a story, very much so. Yeah, uh, after just reading like the first two paragraphs, the first thing I did was just stop and then go to another George Saunders story because I was like, does he always write this way? <laughs> and I thought it was brilliant. He's just like dropping articles, prepositions, and even verbs that you can just assume. <laughs> yes, I love that. Just missing words here and there, but it worked. It really um, told you a lot about the character, in, in my in my opinion. Like the way he was writing, kind of told me what kind of man he was. And um, did anybody else laugh out loud? Mm. All yeah. the time. Yeah, I I was reading it in the middle, and I I had to leave to go walk because I was afraid I was going to wake up the neighbors because I was just cackling. Oh my goodness. I was okay. cracking up. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm laughing. My son's trying to sleep. I need to like leave. There's <laughs> a lovely bit where he's talking about the computer and it's uh, the computer's slow because there's this game on it and he says, acrobats run all jerky due to low memory plus an elephants do not hop equals no fun. <laughs> it's just like, yes. <laughs> you know exactly what he's talking so... about. <laughs> you know, there was so much of this that was really raw um, as someone who if I lived any place else, I would be solidly middle class. But of course, I live where I live. And I've had the experience of dropping my daughter off at a birthday party when she was like in third grade and hearing her say, Oh, mommy, our whole house can fit in this living room really loudly. <laughs> and you're just like, Oh. <laughs> Innocent yeah, there's surprise. a lot of parts of the story. I had a lot of laugh out loud moments, sure, but I also had a lot of just like heartbreaking, like somebody just stabbed me in the chest moments. And they were, and it was never done in a modeling way. I no. think it was really early on. I, I need to find it because there was one where I just like had to stop, and that's when I decided I loved the story because in just one paragraph, the author captured this entire pathology that was heartbreaking. So it was after the party when they go to the rich family's house, and um. It, he's drunk and he's writing in the journal at night and he's like, do not really like rich people as they make us poor people feel dopey and inadequate. It's like this unintended yes. criticism. But then the next morning he goes, just reread that last entry and should clarify. Yeah. Uh, and then No problems with rich people. Aspire to be one someday. <laughs> no, no, I don't hate the rich. One day I too am going to have the fancy Chinese bridge and the trout farm. But then it ends with this like acknowledgement that the Torinis probably have family money. Like, it's this heartbreaking thing because it's like he's feeding himself this, like, impossible bootstrap narrative. And even in the privacy of his own journal, he has to, like, spin this fable that one day him too in order to, like, keep his sense of, like, dignity and pride. And it makes him feel mm -hmm. like I could also be a part of that class. Even though lurking beneath that story, he tells himself, is the suspicion that, no, these classes are entrenched because the Torinis, just by looking at the wealth, he knows it's family money. He knows that's not one bootstrap rags to riches story. And it, it's just, it, it just, it was heartbreaking. Even though he's like, bright eyed, exclamation points everywhere, I'm like, oh. Yeah, I agree. I feel like he touched on and he explored some things that we see every day. But he did it, he did it like with all the band-aids off. There were no band-aids, you know, and uh, that, that whole section was heartbreaking. I also found it heartbreaking when he was talking about 
not buying any clothes for himself because he did, he wanted his daughter to be able to go to school with her head held high and then talking about his wife came from money and she deserves new clothes you know you can't have rich white ex rich wife <laughs> walking around in crappy clothes and um, there was a so much of a sense of how being middle class surrounded by rich people really hurt his sense of masculinity that just broke my heart it was just brilliantly stated but it was real you're right it was heart-wrenching you know I went between thinking really seriously about the story and then laughing my butt off and I think those laughing sections needed to be there because otherwise it could end up being really depressing hole to get into and it wouldn't have been as interesting yeah he's he's he does say at one point he, he he's I, I couldn't work out whether he's jealous envious or admiring of the uh, of the other, the Torinis, um, he's he's or all the above. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sometimes he's he's, he's each of them, because he he's you know he's he's saying that they you know where they got their money from, and, and at least his <laughs> money is going to be <laughs> honestly earned. <laughs> and, oh, I won ten thousand dollars. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciated that conflict of emotions. I think you're right, Gerald. I, I, I don't think he has any one particular emotion about the trainees. I think he's very mixed up about it, and that was portrayed very clearly to me, that he was very torn. And and it has to be nuanced because if it's just envy, just jealousy with no aspiration, it, it breeds a resentment that is unlivable, right? So yeah. He like has to in some way be like, oh, but me too. If not for this, if not for that. But I think I think one part that's very telling has to be when Emmett, the rich father, who is the worst person on the in this, like, just no, like that guy's the worst. But yeah. He, when he's like, oh, what do you do? And the narrator works at a recycling plant. His and the Emmett's response goes, huh. Well, that amazing, the strange, arcane things our culture requires some of us to do. Degrading things, things that offer no tangible benefit. <laughs> How do they expect people to continue to even hold their heads up? And the narrator's response is, could not think of response. Note to self, think of response, send on card, thus striking up friendship with Emmett. <laughs> Question mark? That's very good, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have a feeling this, this episode's going to be a love fest. Uh, Remy, you're being very quiet over there. You know, I, I, I'm trying to listen to pick up on things I may have missed or overlooked. I do think, Maya, what you said about the writing style, I think I might be one of the people who was kind of lost or thrown off by it. Mm -hmm. um, because I guess as a self-proclaimed stickler for grammar, you know, um, <laughs> uh -oh. I couldn't help it. No, I mean, I, I understood now. Like, it's like the the point of journal entries. In, but initially, I was like, okay, so is this like the way people are supposed to be talking in a dysto in this dystopian future? Like, you know how people, you know, use all of the acronyms and the LOL, LOLs and things. I'm like, well, maybe in this, you know, f future, people just eliminated words they deemed unnecessary or something. But it, because of that, it felt very choppy. And it was like difficult to to completely follow along. Like, um, I, yeah, it, there was just a number of examples where it was just like very choppy. When he when he's talking with Emmett, he's like uh, strolling the grounds with Emmett, who is surgeon, does something two days a week with brain inserts, small electronic devices, or possibly biotronic. They are very small. Hundreds can found head of pin or dime. Did not totally follow. I did not totally follow either. <laughs> you know, um, Remy, I have a question. When you read this story, were, did you find yourself reading it quickly? Did you find yourself reading, reading it more slowly? How did you feel as you were actually reading the story? I'm curious. I, it was quicker. Yeah. Okay. I'm just wondering if you're one of the people that the audio version might have worked better for. Because i got to tell you, um, I had a... I love the story both ways, but the audio took out, it helped me understand the language choices better than I did on paper. Um, I definitely got a sense of character from the audio version that I got in the written version, but it was much stronger, and I can see someone who 
is having a hard time getting past the grammar or the lack of grammar in this case, <laughs> really enjoying the audio version because you get that sense of a man kind of talking to himself and speaking shorthand. Um, it reminded me of these two guys that ran away during the war um, in Vietnam. It was a guy and his young son. The house was exploded and they ran into the woods. And they stayed there for like 40 years. And when they were found, they didn't speak anymore because dudes left to their own devices just don't freaking speak. And <laughs> Gerald... And and I can see this as being like the internal voice, you know, that internal voice of man when left to his own devices, he doesn't have to impress anybody, everything's in shorthand and bullet points. Um, you know, that that's how I interpreted it, but I found it easier on audio. Yeah, that might does he change his voice with different characters? No, no. He sounds really young, actually. He sounds like a twenty year old hipster. I was like, <laughs> You narrated this yourself? I'm confused. <laughs> he does not have an old man voice. <laughs> okay, now we're all sitting here trying to think of something horrible to say, I guess. You know, are we all trying to think of something bad to say about the story? <laughs> no, I have like a thousand notes that are just praise, so I'm just like, you know. Wow. Yes. Danny's, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I like this. Oh, I like that. Oh no, I like this. What am I going to say on the podcast? Oh, Rami will hate it. <laughs> He'll save us. <laughs> no, and, and all of the things that you said were kind of like um, heart-rending or really touching. I think all of that, I mean, I felt to some extent when he's also talking about his struggles with money, I think many of us can identify with that as well, but it's counterbalanced by the fact that he's hanging human beings up in his lawn as ornaments. <laughs> but like, everybody that, that, does it. <laughs> yeah. It's, not, it's, it's aspirational. <laughs> and they really want to be there, which reminds me, the ending of the story totally illuminated on paper this pathology, no offense, of white people that are trying to save other people. So it's like, oh, it's for their own good. Oh, they really want to be here. Oh, they need the money for their family. Why would they leave? I don't understand why they would leave. They had it so good. <laughs> and, and then you, and you know, that, that moral ambiguity about whether or not this is okay in this culture, I mean, obviously it's not. Like, there's no way you're going to be like, yes, let's totally hang up these girls on their heads. But it sounds like somebody's was, fetish thing. I, I can just, see going to a BDSM dungeon and seeing girls lined up. I was, I was marking out a place on my lawn, actually. <laughs> But, you know, the, the fact that the justifications that he uses is stuff that in our world we've used to justify other horrors, but then you have the kid, the middle, middle child, Eva, who just turns around and goes, okay, well, why don't we just give them the money? Which is just, I'm like, I could hug you, child. <laughs> totally, totally. It just, it brought to mind all these instances of us going to other cultures to quote unquote save them. Often there's nothing more offensive than the helpfulness of liberals. <laughs> Yeah, the thing is here it's a little bit darker because here it's Oh, they have strings know, stung through they, their brains, you know. Well, yeah, but also but also you know they're desperate for something. And you're desperate for this status symbol. And you, so you justify the horrors of it by being like, I'm giving them this desperate thing, except you're not giving this desperate thing without strings attached. The string is quite literally attached. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you work on that gag? <laughs> oh, but it was so <laughs> good. Now, I swear, I swear. It's it's really, you know what? The story good. lends itself to it. I mean, anytime you have girls strung along your lawn, like paper dolls, with a string running through their brains. I, I th think the puns are kind of built in. You can't avoid them. <laughs> it's, it's so... I, I, I told my wife about it and she sort of scrunched up her face and said, what? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's I'm totally funny. picturing your wife's expression. That's funny. <laughs> it's like, what the hell are you reading? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't think it was that kind of podcast. That's <laughs> just creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! You might be wondering why I'm laughing so much. <laughs> it's horrible. 
You know, I quite frankly, I think this is one of the funniest stories we've read. Like, I, we've read some funny stories, but I can't remember a story where I involuntarily started laughing. And that, you know. <laughs> one, one of the things I liked about it so much is the fact that it's such, it is such a horrible, horrible thing to even contemplate or read about doing. And yet it's just, oh yeah, I'll get some of those and <laughs> tidy up my yard and, and that'll, that'll be really nice. And uh, it's just the way it's just treated as normal. And, and the natural outcome in the normal details, like the truck has to come by three times a day to feed them, allow them to use the bathroom, then they can get back up on your lawn. Um, it was so <laughs> that detail is so plainly stated, and it's a really logical conclusion. I, you know, this is what I love about science fiction, fantasy, anything like that, where it's done really well. It's like they'll take something that's totally ludicrous, but they'll cement it in reality so that you believe it. Like, if they would have just said, these girls just stay up there, it, I wouldn't, I, it probably wouldn't have had as much of an effect. But the fact that the truck has to come by three times a day to feed them and let them to use the bathroom and to do woman things, <laughs> which I also found quite humorous. <laughs> Take care of women issues. <laughs> just, it cemented it in reality so that I could suspend belief and think, oh my god, what kind of world is this? And, and the story's littered with all these tiny little, like, gems. Like, they're at the, the, the rich people party, and they all play Crack the Whip. It's not Pin the Tail on the Donkey. It's, you know, it's Crack the Whip, like this, like, kind of, like, oppressive. Mm -hmm. And then the other game they mentioned is Whack-A-Mole. Like, everything is just, like, this, like, flogging type of, like, stay down, people who should stay down, which I thought was, like, just subtle. And other things, like, it just casually mentions, like, you know, yes, he's super poor, struggling, low middle class, but he's a college graduate. Counts mm. for nothing. Yeah. He's still yeah. scraping the bottom. Or before you know how dire their financial situation is, uh, the part where it really hit me how bad it was when, is when they're at the restaurant, the card gets declined, he goes to the ATM, and the ATM gets declined, and he has a panic, like, oh, there's no money in the account. That's not something people who are financially stable ever feel. No. Yeah. Machine's broken. You yes, know. the machine's broken. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Stuff like that, that was just like, that's so genius. Like, just these little... And I think stuff like that made it so that when he insisted on the fact that well, not poor, middle class, like lower middle class. Like, like right. he can't go that extra step. And you see that all the time. I would say around here, probably 40, 50% of the quote unquote little middle class are poor. They don't know it or they don't admit it. But in our area, one sneeze and they're in the gutter. And so I, I found that um, very natural and, and very realistic and also really a sad diagnosis of something that I see every day. Which is... And this, I was, go ahead, finish it. Right. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Remy. I talk too much. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, for, for this particular family, though, I do believe that they weren't poor. I think it was just a case of them living beyond their means. Like when you finally have a good chunk of money to be able to settle your debts, their first re their first instinct is, okay, maybe we should pay off these credit cards. But that doesn't that sounds too boring. Let's just throw a lavish extravagant party instead. And, and like it but that's something the middle class people do. Like, no, yeah, yeah. It's like it's still, poor people yeah. would have yeah. gone out and bought groceries and paid off the electricity that hasn't been paid in six months. <laughs> and the father, the father, although he's kind of blunt and harsh about it, when he says, like, you know, the way you're living is not right, at the end, like the wife says, you know, maybe that does sound like us. <laughs> Maya, something's wrong with your microphone. Wow. Oh. No? There you oh, go. that's there you it. Go. You're back. Yeah. Okay. What were you saying? Um, I, I think that is something that is very solidly middle class. I think that people that are on the border between poor and middle class, they actually have the credit to get in trouble. They actually feel like they should have things. And so they get themselves in trouble because it's a lot of should, should, why not? I have a college education, I have a good job, I should have these things. And I, I thought that was really realistic. I love how desperate he is to be seen as a good 
dad to his daughter and how much that gets him into trouble. You know, and it's always about the eldest. That poor middle, that poor little girl. <laughs> she just totally glossed over. But um, I, I think that that was really heart wrenching for me. You know. Rami, do you feel like the fact that they didn't make the financially prudent decision was an inhibitor to you sympathizing with them? Like, was that something where you were like, well, you got yourself in this, or could you still sympathize? Mm. So were you dad? <laughs> yeah, were you farmer rich? <laughs> yeah, not, not. Well, no, because I mean, I guess like it would be kind of hypocritical for me to say that because I've done had poor choices in the past, but I do think that it, there's a difference when you have a family and you know people who you support and are relying on you. I mean, yeah. So yeah, you're right. I I think that did it uh, inhibit my ability to empathize or sympathize. Which I think is really interesting because I see those choices all the time. You see families in a house that's too big for them or a car that's too nice for them and they feel like they're fine but if somebody loses a job two months later they're totally up a creek without a paddle because everyone is two steps ahead of where they should be as far as their living style. Yeah, but I'm still completely, it, it's sort of like you should have done, yes, you should have done the financially prudent decision, but I'm still sympathetic because it's like... It's your kid, and she needs her mm. birthday, and you already feel crappy. It's not just that, but it's like you're asking, you're asking people to continue to self-log, to make the hard decisions that the wealthy people who say should have, could have, would have would never are even in that position to do some of them because you know they worked like farmer rich wasn't that rich but like the true like the tureen even for the tureen would be like well that was dumb because they've never in their lives even as children or adults had to make that choice and i just feel like it's infuriating it must be if you're to be in a position where it's like if i do the financially prudent thing I continue to feel like I am not as worthy as the people around me. I don't have these status symbols. My kids grow up feeling poor and dejected, and how will that affect their psyche? Which I thought was very well sort of woven in. Like you see the justification. It's not just I want to have the Semplica girls. It's I want my daughters to be able to say that they grew up in a house where they had Semplica girls like everybody else. And when you see it that way, it's like should have done the financially prudent thing because we live in a world where like your one mistake karma comes right in like a few days later and ruins it for you but i can't come down too hard on parental that. guilt is really potent man parental guilt will make you do things that you're just like i really should not be doing this but i hear you i understand <laughs> but that's why it's important to strike a balance i'm not well yeah I shouldn't have thrown a party but then spending I don't know seven or eight thousand dollars I mean okay if you're really intent on buying you know these girls uh, which sounds yeah, very then don't buy the, the Hummel figurines no I, or <laughs> don't buy four or how many ever just get two. <laughs> what you're gonna have one self like a girl on the lot <laughs> I don't okay, think they got it <laughs> make it two it's like, plural <laughs> <laughs> you know what I also love was was how proud he was that he didn't quote unquote go overboard. You know, um, I don't think he spent the whole ten grand on the yard. I think he probably had like a thousand left over. <laughs> also, I like how Maya's like, what? You're only gonna have one Semplica girl? She's already in this society. Like, what are you? That would just be unseemly. Oh, look at them. They can only have one Semplica girl. <laughs> That's worse than none. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you totally know Maya would have at least two or three. <laughs> I want some Semplica dudes. Does that make you uncomfortable, Gerald? Not at all. No, no, no. no. Um, it's, <laughs> this is now a meme, isn't it? This, <laughs> oh, great. Go. I just had a visual of Gerald as a Semplica guy. <laughs> Uh oh, that's not good. No, that's um, no good at all. Nightmare. There's also there's also another thing that 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 you know that they've been getting by. They they they're not rich. They're not that comfortable off. But but they've been getting by and and they're doing okay. And then bam, they get this lump of cash. So and and you know I we've had this these discussions in the past where you know you get a lump of money for whatever reason and you think. You know, what are we going to do with it? And you could, yeah, you could do the sensible thing and, you know, put it into the bills and put it in the bank account. It just sort of fritters away. So, so what you want to do is, is to celebrate the fact. And and I can see them. They celebrated the fact they won this ten grand by, 
by doing by the work. It. Doing <laughs> yeah, by splurging. And, and splurging is okay. Wasn't I think you're there... being too hard on these people. I, I, you know, I, I can really understand where they're coming well, from. Well, I, I, I think that they made the wrong decision, but I think it's totally human. The statistics on happiness of lotto owners kind of attest to that. Most people that won the lottery are in much worse condition, you know, five, ten years after winning than before because they literally blow it. They get themselves in holes. They buy houses that aren't good investments. They, they. Having money and knowing how to live with money are two different things. Mm. And if you're always scraping by and then suddenly you have money, that's a very uncomfortable place to be. And people naturally want to get back to a place of homeostasis. And they will blow it. They will have friends and family borrow. And then all of a sudden they look around and they're in tons of debt and they're living on the street. And, and, and also, what they do is they, you know, they win a million or something and think, "Wait, we're millionaires!" And they look at other millionaires and say, "We'll have the big house and the Ferrari and, and the boat and all this sort of stuff." But these other millionaires are earning a million pound a year or something. They, they, their money. They don't just have in. one million because a million <laughs> doesn't go very far. <laughs> I found that too. It's it's terrible, isn't it's it? It's a very small amount of money in the <laughs> scheme of things. People don't realise. <laughs> It's so hard, isn't it, Gerald? <laughs> Note for a podcast, I don't have a million dollars. <laughs> well, and, and something else, because we're talking about, like, you know, the money comes in and the way that it makes you feel and the things that it inspires you to do. But something else that I thought, because the story just has so many layers, I'm, like, in love, mm. was when mm -hmm. he, and he wins that lottery, and it's not just what he can buy. Like, all of a sudden, it's, like, just having that stress lifted allows him to start dreaming even just of self-improvement. Things like make a point of oh. noticing beauty of the world. Why not educate self regarding <laughs> birds, flowers, trees, and constellations? Um, I see now that I was asleep, you know, like this is his wake-up call. As if like just, just having that stress be gone. Like he wants to learn how to play guitar. He's going to start working out every day. He's going to go up to the boss and ask for a raise. Like just the way that it unshackles you in so many ways. Yeah. I, I think it goes beyond even just a stress relief. I think it changed his self-concept from that as a loser to that of a winner. If I can win the lottery, maybe I can win in other places in my life, too. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really well done. <laughs> Because that that's that you see that every day, you know, people when they get in a hole and they think that they aren't worth it and they're never going to have anything, you know, then they make even worse decisions and they really don't have anything um, because it's coming out of that self concept. Wow, this story was just so amazing. I love this story so so much. Well, um, I'll just look at my notes now and just sort of one of the things. After they'd been to the party, they came back and they, they found that the, the dog tied up to the, the tree or something. They'd kind of forgotten about. I mean, what, the, what a brilliant phrase. I just, I just loved bits like that in the story. They'd kind of forgotten about it. They just, you know, they don't really care about their poor old dog. You know, a part that made me sort of stop and, like, snort derisively had to be when they're announcing lunch at the rich party and they're like, selfish from Guatemala flown in today and bur and a Burmese spice that had to be bribed out of the country. And I'm like, I just want to punch these people in the face. <laughs> like, yeah. how annoying. <laughs> but, but genius. Like, he didn't have to tell you. Like, it's not like the narrators there are like, oh, this is the most obnoxious thing. Just by saying, selfish flown in from Guatemala. That's it. That's all you need. <laughs> 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 Okay, yeah, this has turned into a love fest. You know, I think we should have a talk on the fact that this was written in a way that could turn off some readers. Um, where do you want to start with that, Rami? You want to take the lead since you had issues with the way it was written? Well, I think I kind of said everything I had to say about just that it it became choppy and then distracted me and then you know tr I tried to like pick up like which words were consistently omitted and I, I, I was trying to figure out okay maybe there was some symbolism with that like for instance the, the word I and the wasn't used for a while but then I see it used so I'm like okay never mind and I, yeah I, I guess I was just overly distracted by by the writing style. You know, it, it brings to mind, because we've had a couple stories now that were fairly experimental, 
And experimental fiction definitely has its ideal reader. Um, that kind of fiction just requires so much more from the reader. What are your guys' thoughts on experimental fiction as of yet? I'm, I'm sure it's going to change as we read more of it, but you know, reading Black Box and reading this story. Yeah, it, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? And and you you sort of you, you kind of have to. What, what did I say? Something you um, revolution causes evolution. So so in order to for writing to progress, um, you know, you have to do some weird stuff, and and yeah, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. And and I I've certainly read stuff that I, I haven't liked, and I can't get on with, and I can't. It's difficult to read, and I think if there's a story that's diff physically, visually difficult to read, then you you, it, it, you spend all of your time <laughs> doing the mechanics of reading and not um, not enjoying the story. And and you know when you say that, that reminds me of the issue that literary fiction is having right now, because statistically our reading levels have lowered. Um, my mother. The books that she read in elementary school, my kids read in high school. Like the reading level since the 30s is significantly lower. And the books that I read in high school, my daughter's reading in college. You know, and and there is that sense that as reading levels lower, literary fiction becomes harder to understand. So People that use, are used to reading easier to read stories with easier to read language with really strong plots that are easier to saddle on to may have a much more difficult time reading some types of literary fiction. And I know that the going thought has been to write for the audience because everybody deserves to have those ideas passed on to them. But at the same time, my thought is I don't want to lose the art of literary fiction just because a smaller percentage of people can actually read well enough to enjoy it. I, you can read the story, but if your reading level is lower, it's harder to step a, step outside the story and enjoy it. And I'm thinking of some amazing stories I've read lately that were work. And it wasn't that I couldn't read it, but I was reading slow enough that I couldn't visualize things. My brain processed things slower just because I wasn't used to reading on that level. You know, and it may take a year or two years to be able to read that in a really fluid way. I've talked to grad students who say their reading ability before grad school and after grad school was like night and day. And they're reading books now that they thought were boring and didn't have any action. And now they're reading them as if they're reading, you know, a thriller novel because they're reading so much faster. So what do you guys think of the change in reading abilities and how authors, what is, what is the author's responsibility if you want to be experimental or if you want to push language or if you want to write in a way that's not normal what is your responsibility to readers I th I think it depends what you want to achieve as a writer and if all you want to do is to sell for, for want of a better phrase pulp fiction um, fiction that is easily digestible by the mass in other words you want a nice house yeah, <laughs> A or something, you know, and then, then, um, then, then that's what you do. But I, I think if if you're a, a think, I'm going to pee off some some writers here, but if you're oh, a, just a, say it. A think if you're a thinking sort of writer, you will also yes, you can do that stuff, but you you should also try other things, try doing weird things. Um, I can't remember. I've I've done some some strange stuff, and I I, I just um, earlier this this afternoon I linked to someone who someone who's asking about <coughs> romance that I I'd written under a pseudonym, and and I'd done it in is over a month in thirty tweets, um, and it was I looked back at it, and I thought actually it ain't that bad. It's it's, yeah. it's interesting. It's not a story. You can't you know it, it's just tweets, but the, there's a story underneath it. So I think. I think it it yeah, it all depends, yeah, and and it's because that's to... the problem. If if you're if you have a normal audience that is used to reading you, and then you do something experimental, you turn off that audience. Mm. You know, so is this going to be a case of whenever whenever a writer wants to experiment with writing, they have to have like their experimental pen name because you can't make a living off that because nobody can read it. 
Yeah, Maya, I think you brought up a very good point with uh, the decline of reading levels and, and all that, but I would be careful not to equate um, reading level with this experimental writing that you talk about, because for instance, like this story, I don't think it had a reading level that was too high. Um, I just personally prefer you know, sound, I guess, like grammar or like, you know, rhetorical devices, maybe. I don't know. But you were able to read it. That's my point. If someone like us reads the story and has to work, the average person who doesn't read a lot will read the story and it will fly right over their head. Because you're willing to do the work. You, you're a heavy reader. <laughs> but you got through the story. You didn't just throw it in the air and say, fuck it. <laughs> I like right to, to, to have everything like on the table. Okay, this is what I'm working. I don't like, I noticed because what was it? there was another story, I think, as well. And I think like you also made the same comment that, um, yeah, I think, you know, the reader has to do more work. I realize I just like to visual, be able to visualize myself there, put myself, you know, in the person's shoes and not be distracted by the writing style, which then, like, removes uh, me from, from the story. Yeah. yeah which no, is interesting, because sometimes writing style is the point of the story. Yeah. Huh. But I was just going to say, I think our listeners, though, like, this isn't, I don't think this is a story they would struggle with. I think that's kind of... No, no. It's not, it's not specific to this story. I'm just pondering because I, I've read this and I've, got, I've been looking at my TBR and I've got some more difficult books on my TBR that I feel like I need to read other books before I can read them and get the most out of them. I've also been getting my way through uh, an amazing book called How to Read a Book. I've been reading it forever, but it's such an amazing book. It's, it's on the different levels of reading and how to improve your reading and how even college-level reading isn't very analytical anymore. Like, people have a hard time analyzing what they're reading. And so, for me, it brought to mind the question, some of the stories we've been reading require you to analyze it. And if you're writing those types of stories, you have to admit that your audience is going to be much, much smaller. And it, it's kind of the question of, is it the responsibility of the reader or is it the responsibility of the author to make your stories accessible? Well, I think if you're writing in a certain way, you should have some sort of expectation of like who it, it's going to be targeted or geared towards and who's going to appreciate it. Like if you, if you write a story in like Klingon or whatever, Right, and you should know that yeah, it's going to be for the Star Trek people. Yeah, there's there's also a thing about uh, there's a, a a conception, uh, and I don't know if it's true that the attention spans are shorter than they used to be, and we keep being told this, and we keep people say when they're talking about you know the craft of writing, it was particularly you know you have to the first few sentences have to be punchy you have to grab the reader straight away um, because if if you don't get them in seven seconds they're gone and and it, it that's a market I suspect that's that's mass market and a lot of people and, and now you have so more so many more choices and you can click, do a couple of clicks and look inside and read the first page of a book and think that nah, I'm not going to read that which is what you used to do in a shop. You used to pick it off the, the shelf and have a look and think, no, uh -huh. I'm not going to read that. Um, but there are people around who like to get into a book and, and who who are willing to not be hit over the head with with you know the media res thing and 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 straight into the action and, and grabbing the reader and and people. This it's it's this author advice is. It, there's every sort of shade of this and you know you shouldn't start with dialogue and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and you, you shouldn't write a prologue and, and all this sort of stuff and, and in actual fact you write what the hell you like and if it, if you don't make money off from it then it's not mass market but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't write it yeah you know it's it's funny when I look at a lot of the literary classics 
I, I love, I've been trying to chip my way through a, a fairly small, a fairly decent sized stack of literary classics over the last few years. And when I look at them, they all have story. But a lot of times the way they're written requires you to do the work and you can get so caught up in doing the work that you miss the story. And so, like, I'm still chipping my way through War and Peace. People say War and Peace is boring. How in the hell is it boring? Like, that story, it's just one, it's one Michael Bay scene followed by Titanic. You know, it's got love, it's got intrigue, it's got drunk frat boys falling out of windows. You know, but it's boring because the language requires you to do so much work that it pulls you out of the story so that you can't, like, fully enjoy the action of the story. But when I look at those literary classics, you know, liter literary writing has this reputation of being all about character and nothing happens, but literary classics, by and large, were not written to be literary classics. So you've got love stories that end up being literary classics. You've got action stories that end up being literary classics. You know, and it's just this question, you know, I look at them and I think none of these would be published nowadays. Every single one would have ended up in the select file. Mm. They've all got telling instead of showing. They all start slow. They've all got too much character. They've got bloated par bloated chapters. I can't... Maybe The Great Gatsby would have been published. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, most of Dickens, yeah. you know, they would just toss it right into the slash pile and tell you to go back and get your MFA. <laughs> it makes me kind of sad. I remember a few years ago, I read War of the Worlds, because I, you know... I knew the premise in the story, but I never actually read it. And even though it's about an alien invasion, like it doesn't get any more plot heavy than that, there were sections that I struggled to get through because there was these huge, huge flashbacks to like idyllic times in the countryside where I'm just like, no, go back to the aliens. <laughs> you know? Even um, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland is a tough read. That was a children's book. My mom read that in third grade. I couldn't read it until high school. You know, it was not an easy read, and it was a thick book. <laughs> It's like, yeah. And then the picture of Dorian Gray, I love almost all of it. For most of it, I didn't get bugged down except one chapter, which is just the things that Dorian Gray owns. See, that's <laughs> the Totally published that book, but they'd be like, this chapter is gone now. It's like oh, the God. Devil's Wear Prada in the 18 something. <laughs> yeah, I, I always tell the story that we were in a book club and we, we were given this book by. Um, you know the book. I don't know if you've heard of the Booker Prize over here. It's big, most prestigious prize for 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 writing, and and it was a prize-winning book. It was, and and we're all in this book club. There's about a dozen people of us, and every single one couldn't get through it because it was just so badly edited. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's a Booker Prize winner, then it's wonderful and it's glorious. And, and yeah. When you get away from it, it's no. Well, you I know, it's fair to I, say that standards have changed. Right? Mm -hmm. And, mm. Um, you know, like you said, I think a lot of the works that we are made to read now or like in the literary canon are such because someone told us they are. <laughs> and then it just continued that way. But what gets me is a lot of new literary fiction instead of, okay, you have your original literary fiction that was, you were writing an alien story and ended up being so good or so distinct or so different or so noteworthy that it was put into the canon. That's how literary fiction used to become literary fiction. Nobody wrote quote-unquote literary fiction. They wrote mystery, love stories, everyday, coming of age, whatever. Now we have writers that want to write literary fiction, and that's what I'm trying to get away from, because I recognize that I love literary fiction, I want to write literary fiction, but in order to write literary fiction well, I have to not write literary fiction, I have to just write good stories. Yeah, and I think sort of coming right back around to your original question, I think as writers, you, you write your story. You, don't, you shouldn't write it to be a certain thing. If you want to tell the story, you want to tell the story and, and, and tell it as best you can. And if it's yeah, literary, it's literary. Yeah. Yeah, good. exactly. And on that note, um, I have a doctor's appointment in 20 minutes, so... Yeah. Okay. We should rate. Let's rate and we'll do the game. Okay, who's going to go first? 
Should we get me out of the way since it won't be a surprise that I'm giving it a six? Uh, let's just. Who's not giving it a six? Yeah. <laughs> not giving it a six. <laughs> like, Rammy. literally, it's only Rami. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. What did you give it, Rami? Three. You oh. gave it a three. We're all sixes. That is really funny because I said that as a joke. Wait, Gerald, That's... you're a six as well? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 because I struggled with this because I read it, read it first, and I read it again. I thought this is a six, but I gave it a six last week. I can't give six two weeks running. Yes, but, you can. <laughs> but I was, I was going around the house doing various things, and I thought this story is sticking with me. It, it's, I'm thinking about it so much. Um, it's got to be a six. Yeah, I was, I was only five pages in when I knew this is going to be a six, and. It, <laughs> That's how you know it's good. I, this for me is probably the favorite story, my favorite story that we've done on this podcast, and um, it's the only story where that when we got to the end of it, I'm like, I need to read this like a thousand more times. Yeah, it's like I mean, you're almost disappointed that it ended. Yeah. yeah, I definitely had that feeling. You know, there are a lot of great stories you read them and they just don't stick with you. And this is a story that if someone said, "Oh, have you ever read Semplica Diaries?" I could literally tell them the entire story and know exactly what it was without having to refresh my brain. Which is kind of rare. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's it's over to me now because um, for those who don't know, occasionally we'll we'll try and reach out to our authors and and say hi, we're featuring your story, which is sometimes a bit tricky because I think it's easy to forget. Because we're not always nice. <laughs> we're not always nice, and sometimes it's easy to forget that this thing on the internet is actually a real person. So, um, but anyway, I, I I got in touch with Sarah Frisch from last week's story, and I said, "Hi, we've done your story," and and this is what she said. Um, she said, "Wow, this is incredible! It's a complete and utter gift to be able to see to be a fly on the wall for such a smart, in-depth conversation of my work." This was our podcast, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was the episode <laughs> that we were arguing. Yeah. <laughs> Tell Maya and Anais that my feelings weren't hurt at all, and I'd love to have a drink with either of them, or any of you. Let me know if you're ever in San Francisco. Also, I almost fell out of my chair laughing when Rami said, that's the equivalent of saying, I have a lot of black friends. So, <laughs> I'm so glad you chose and loved the story. Listening to this really was a wonderful experience and really helpful to me as a writer. Thank you so much. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. You know, we've gotten some feedback from several authors over the past, well, almost year that we've been doing this. Can you believe it's been that long? And it always amazes me how the wonderful feedback that we get, you know, even though we're not all, we, we're, we're not glowing, we definitely rip stories apart, we talk about what we're really feeling about stories. Sarah's story definitely created a podcast divided. And um, it made me feel really good to, to read that. It made me feel like we're on the right track. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Maybe happy. Yes. I always love Thank you very so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, two weeks in a row, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, yahoo, people like us. They really like us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think some for some people, their favorite part is the game. I've heard that from Gerald as well. <laughs> Oops. Oops. That was private. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> on this podcast. But I think it's because Gerald wins so often. That's why it's his favorite. Yeah, yeah he's like a genius. So this is going to be a fix, obviously. <laughs> I think, Gerald, what he should do is have, like, a scoreboard of how many times he's won, print it out, and then that's his status symbol, which, by the way, is the theme of this week's game. Whoa. Whoa. Look at her, how she weaves that shit together. That's she's a fantastic. genius. Genius. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out like a description of a status symbol and then give you options and you have to guess which one it is. You'll be fine. It's easy. Okay. But first, shouldn't we submit our stories? Oh, yeah. You should submit your stories. See, I'm so excited. Submit your stories. What are we playing for? Or what okay. Is Gerald, what is I, Gerald going to win? What, what is Gerald going to win? Well, Gerald, what are we reading this week? <laughs> Roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> I'm on the off chance that, that uh, I win. I'd like to put forward Bitter Grounds by Neil Gaiman. Ooh. Oh. Gerald will win. Okay, never mind. I, I'm just... <laughs> Gerald. Yes. Win. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, I'm submitting, I, I'm going to butcher this, Crocolandia by 
Chris Arnold. It's on the Kenyan Review. My recommendation is to build a fire by Jack London. Uh, we already did that one. Darn it. Yeah, I was afraid you did. Okay. Let yeah, me... you got to look at the list, man. <laughs> Let me go to one perhaps that I dominated before then. Uh, okay, we'll give you a second. <laughs> That's really funny. All right. The, all right, let's do this one. Um, the Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. Ooh, we haven't done that one. Okay. I, yeah, I knew you did a Jack London. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the list on the website up to date specifically because we're getting to the point where we're reading so many stories we need to make sure that we don't double dip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, Rami, you're going first. Shoot. Are you scared? No. Don't be. Yeah, should be. <laughs> okay, in the 17th wow. and 18th century, this fruit was kept above mantles as a status symbol even as they rotted. Was it a pineapple, a star fruit, or a durian? Ugh! Uh, um, pineapple. A pineapple. Good job. Uh, at the time, the pineapple was the equivalent of a 5,000 pound investment today. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. Okay, Gerald. You. This flower nearly bankrupted 17th century Holland. Merchants surrounded their estates with this flower. Was it roses, tulips, or poppies? Tulips. Tulips, yep. And at the height of this tulip mania, the bulb cost 10 times the annual income of a skilled craftsman. And you could buy a house with a tulip bulb. Crazy times. <laughs> wow. Okay, Do I get Maya. an extra point? Yep. <laughs> no. You're already going to win. Okay. Maya. The Krakow, or Poulain, was a long pointed shoe in the Middle Ages. Edward III restricted shoe length for commoners to a maximum of how many inches? A maximum of six inches, nine inches, or three inches? Six. Six. Yep. The longest wow. known shoe tip was two feet long. Uh, wow. Yeah, people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that just seems like it would be very uncomfortable to walk in. <laughs> okay, Rami. The Victorian practice of rotting your teeth was meant to signify what? That you drank a lot of expensive red wines? That you... Um, I can't read my own handwriting. That you chewed an expensive tar-clogged tobacco or that you ate a lot of sugar? Sugar. Sugar. Guys, if you get everything right, what are we going to do? I don't know. We somebody got to start failing because I got a doctor's appointment. <laughs> well, I guess you can like, do like a death match in a cage. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong story. <laughs> in the 17th and 18th century, no noble estate was complete without a jester, a hermit, or a pianist. Jester. A hermit. Oh. Yes, he got one wrong. <laughs> Yeah, this is bizarre as hell. They would hire somebody to live in a shack in the garden, own lots of books, and preach at guests if they came in, like some like crazy oh, academic who like lived in their garden. Kidding. They would hire actors wow. to do this. So maybe the Semblica girls aren't so far off the point. Okay. <laughs> no. They're there. Okay. And less, less cheering when I get a question wrong, please. <laughs> <laughs> but it I happens so that. rarely. <laughs> Rami never won. It's not okay. even as a guest. So, <laughs> okay. okay, Maya, in the early 20th century, Americans owned what medical device as a status symbol? A set of surgical tools, an x-ray, or a wheelchair? Wheelchair. X-ray, which is bizarre. No. And dangerous. <laughs> they would hang up their, like, skeleton x-rays. Like, look at this, curiosity. Good okay. Grief. Rami. Common in most um, households today, these toys were once popular diplomatic gifts between rulers. Is it board games, porcelain dolls, or bicycles? What when, What timeline? Uh, just over time, forever. Middle Ages and 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, popular gifts... Um, porcelain dolls. 
porcelain dolls? Nope, it was board games. Uh, the idea was that you had so much free time, you could just sit around playing board games. Okay. That, it's, I don't know. Status like symbols. you do. Gerald. Yeah. To Ty Rami. 18th and 19th century estates, again, needed this on their property to be complete. Swans, paddle boats, fake ruins. Swans. Nope. Fake ruins. They were known as follies. People are strange when they are strangers. <laughs> okay, Maya. This is going to annoy Gerald because he probably knows this one, which is why I didn't give it to him. Uh. Maya. <laughs> um, to Ty Rami. A brand of Swedish made stoves that were a status symbol in English homes in the 20th century. Is it Electrolux, AGA, or IKEA? Electrolux? AGA. Uh, and apparently, when they were introduced to America in the 1980s, their popularity plummeted. <laughs> so. <laughs> Because we're just so not cool. We're just classic. We're all cool like the Americans. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Rami also, won. Also known as Three. Gerald, how does it feel? It's okay. Time out. I'm not a sore loser. I'm just going. Uh, <laughs> wait, I thought Maya had two right as well. Did no, she had it? one right. She got the first one right. Yep. Oh. Then I went downhill. Wow, I'm actually in disbelief that I won. Thank yeah, you. So how does it feel? Where are you going to go now? <laughs> going to celebrate. Go Do you feel like a party. winner? <laughs> not invite any of you. <laughs> so what are we reading please? next week? <laughs> uh, I forgot. Okay, yeah, this one is a pretty quick one. It's the necklace. And actually, okay, okay. it follows like the same theme of this story. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, nice about like financial struggles and stuff. Okay. Okie dokie. But before you read that, head over to literaryroadhouse.com and leave a comment. Showing off your brilliant insights to Sandra's story is the ultimate status symbol. And what's the second greatest status symbol? Helping others find our show by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker, and by sharing our podcast with your friends. Until next time, read a good story. I'm going to do a notice real quick about the website, and you can cut this in earlier because we forgot. Okay. I, what am I going to say? I want to thank everybody for their patience over the last week. If you have been on the website, you will have noticed that the website was experiencing some technical difficulties, and that is because we have a brand new website. We, I've been working frantically for the past week to improve the performance and to add some functionality in preparation for NAESA's great announcement. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. And that should be it. Great. Take uh, us off air. Yes. Stop. I should have.